Well, I'm so excited to be here. Um, on behalf of myself and all the students here, thank you so much for your generosity. Um, I am a second year student, and so I will be conducting my first full field season this summer. So I don't have lots of data, but I have lots of ideas to share with you. And so that's what, where we'll begin. So our lab studies coral reefs, and we know a lot after a half century of intensive study. Coral reefs are economically and ecologically and culturally important throughout the world. They're also in, in decline throughout the world. We know that coral algal interactions are key and that grazers influence the direction of coral algal interactions. We also know that diversity or the number of species in a habitat has strong influences on ecosystem function and with higher diversity typically increasing the function and stability of ecosystems. We know so much. So sometimes it's hard to figure out what do we not know. But there are a lot of information gaps out there still. So two that I've decided to explore are the roles of cryptic invertebrates. Cryptic invertebrates are, sminy, or, sorry, sminy, are tiny um, invertebrates such as snails, shrimps, worms, things smaller than your pinky finger that live in the reef framework. And we know very little about their abundance, composition, their functions, or their importance in coral reef ecosystems. Another aspect I want to study is the role of urchin diversity. From research in the Caribbean, we know that urchins are extremely important grazers in coral reefs and that high abundances of urchins favors coral dominance. But in the tropical Pacific, urchins can be extremely diverse, with 10 to 15 species of urchin occurring, coexisting in the same coral reef. And we don't know how important it is to have a high diversity of urchins. Does one species of urchin function the same as another species, or are they feeding differently and behaving differently such that if you combine the species together, they might have a, a much larger effect than if you were just additive, or if it was just an additive um, interaction. So that was the outline of my talk. I'll start off talking about cryptic invertebrates, and then we'll move on to urchins. So when researchers go out to a reef, this is the back reef of, of Kingman, Kingman Reef. We look at a lot of the large things. Obviously, we see coral. We see lots of parietes heads. Oftentimes, we see lots of big snappers and sharks and urchins. But what we don't study oftentimes are the little creatures. And I've planted a bunch of little creatures in this picture and see if you can pick some of them out. It's like a Where's Waldo of coral reef ecology. And we don't see them. That's why they're so understudied. But if we brave the sharks and go out at night, this is what we might see. We might see lots of little invertebrates scampering all about the reef. And this leads to lots of questions. Who are they? What are they doing? How important are they to the, the function and stability and persistence of coral reef ecosystems? A lot of research right now is just trying to find out who they are, trying to catalog the diversity of coral reefs. And as we gain more and more knowledge in this area, we're starting to learn that coral reefs might be just as diverse, if not more diverse, uh, or say invertebrates in coral reefs might be just as diverse or more diverse than insects in rainforests. Such that we might say that instead of saying coral reefs are the rainforests of the sea, we might say that rainforests are the coral reefs of the land. But there's a lot we still don't know. Is it reasonable to think that these small, tiny invertebrates are important? Well, from research in temperate ecosystems, the answer is yes. We know that they're important in seagrass beds. We know they're important in kelp forests. We also know they're extremely important in rocky intertidal communities and many other ecosystems. It's interesting, however, that in coral reefs, we really know so little. A review by Dr. Barb Carpenter back in 1997 suggested that the sheer number and diversity of these creatures is, quote, daunting, um, which is one of the reasons we probably don't know much. And he also suggests, based on the few studies that had been done at the time, that these creatures probably have minor effects. But other researchers, simply by looking at the abundance of these species and the metabolic rates, have simply scaled up their possible contribution to reef uh, food webs. And the results suggest it could be huge. Up, they might even graze up to 30% of the daily production of algae in these systems. So what kind of questions would I ask? Very, very simple ones. How do the abundance and diversity of these creatures, uh, of these cryptic invertebrates, vary in coral reef habitats? What are the factors that determine their abundance and diversity? And what are the functional roles of these dominant species? To address this, we're using high-tech technology known as digital cameras. <laughs> and we're placing these underwater digital cameras all across the reef. 
and taking time-lapse images through the evening. And what's nice about using time-lapse imaging is that we're not destructing the reef and we're observing these creatures in their natural habitat. And so I have a short, if I can figure out where my cursor is, a short little example of what we might see on these time-lapse films. And so as evening falls, we'll see more and more invertebrates coming out in these time-lapse films. We see the arms of brittle stars. We see little tiny strings moving around, and these are the arms of, of spaghetti worms. We see a rock boring urchin on the upper um, side of the screen. We see shrimps flashing in and out of view. We see lots of activity, even little hermit crabs scampering about on, on the surface. And so again, the, question, the, the questions that come from this type of work are, what are they doing? How many are there, and what is their diversity? We've collected these types of time series across the tropical Pacific, in the Line Islands, from Christmas to, to Kingman Reef, and also in Maui, where I'm working now. And a lot of this work has been done either, I'll, I'll say with, but a lot of it by a Dr. Forrest Rower from San Diego State. And so we're collaborating and combining our data sets. And so we have seven different, um, so we've collected these data from seven different islands and atolls across the Pacific. And our future efforts are going to look at the diets and isotopes uh, or the isotopic signatures of these species to try and infer function. What are they eating? What are they doing? What is their role? And even further into the future, we're hoping to look at their predators, so fishes such as wrasses and goat fishes, um, trying to understand how do, these small creatures in, uh, how do these small creatures impact energy flow through reefs, and how do their predators affect their, the community structure of these little uh, creatures. So now we're going to switch gears and talk about urchins. So in Hawaii, coral reefs are declining, just like in many other places. And these declines appear to be associated with large algal blooms. So for example, we might see that nice pretty reef turn to something like this covered in what Jeremy Jackson calls slime. And the reason for this isn't clear, but possible likely causes are local pollution and also overfishing of herbivores that are the lawnmowers of the reef controlling those algal blooms. So in response, Maui established the world's first herbivore fishery management area where herbivores are specifically protected. And the idea about this is to, is to increase the lawn mowing capability of the herbivore communities. And one of my lab mates, Emily Kelly, not the turtle, but the woman behind the turtle, is doing a lot of amazing research right now looking at grazing budgets, in particular looking at, at fishes and how important fishes are in maintaining uh, the proper reef structure and controlling algal blooms. But one of the things she isn't looking at is the diversity of Hawaii's urchins. And so again, in any reef, we might see 10 to 15 species of urchin, and we don't know what they're all doing. And so they might be consuming a host of different types of algae. There could be hundreds of species of algae that they could be selecting or not selecting. And so this leads to some very straightforward questions that are important. Do urchin species eat different types of algae? Do they feed at different rates? How does having many urchin species or high richness affect the grazing potential of urchins? So how do we get at this? We do field grazing assays. So we can put cages out in the field, place algae in an array, uh, some sort of random array, and then put urchins in the cage and let them choose what they want to eat. Pretty straightforward. And we can measure the mass of the algae before and after and get a consumption rate for each species of alga. For low profile species, such as crustose corallins, or for terps, we have to be a little more clever because we can't just measure them before and after. And so what we do is we take a picture before and take a picture after, and then we can use image analysis software to estimate the amount of material that was consumed. The data that we collect from these types of experiments look like this. And quick orientation, um, we have percent consumed of the different types of algae on the, on the y-axis. On the left, we have the control. And it's nice that no algae was consumed when there were no urchins. And when there were urchins, um, this is what we see. This species, this banded urchin, liked macroalgae and it appeared, like it, it appeared as though it liked to eat all different kinds of macroalgae, fairly equally. And so what might we con conclude from this type of uh, analysis? Well, this species appears to be a macroalgal generalist. We can also uh, infer the grazing rate by simply looking at the grams consumed. And we can use these grazing rates to scale up to the grazing, or to scale up and look at grazing budgets on these coral reefs. So the future directions are to, to not only look at this one species, but look at a whole series of species of urchins 
and try to understand how much diet overlap and specificity there is among these urchin populations. And another goal in the future is to look at or experimentally test the effects of urchins, um, of urchin diversity on algal communities. And so one way to do that is to simply have the same density of urchins in two replicates, one with low diversity, for example, one species, one with high diversity, with four species, and then examine what are the, the ultimate effects of that community on algal communities. And so what we might predict is that the more diverse community will have urchins eating more types of algae, which would thus have a much larger effect on the algal community. So what's the significance of this kind of work? Again, the goal is to develop some sort of algal grazing budget where we know production, we know consumption, and then we can infer reef status, whether it's degrading, it's stable, or it's recovering. And there are also management implications. For example, right now in, uh, on Oahu, we're actually breeding urchins and outplanting them on reefs to try and control invasive algae. And so one of the questions we might ask is, should we be planting a single species, or should we be outplanting some sort of urchin cocktail onto the reef to get the best effect? And so in sum, uh, the research I'm conducting right now is looking at, at complexity in these coral reefs. We need to understand how they work in terms of cryptic invertebrates and the diversity of urchins in order to really understand their functions and how we can best protect them. And with that, I'd just like to thank um, my advisor, Jennifer uh, Stewart, Emily, who's been my mentor and, and dive buddy in Hawaii, Forrest, who, who started this, uh, this digital time-lapse imagery project, and of course, all my lab mates and buddies. And funding's been provided by the San Diego Fellowship, NSF Eigert, Hawaii Coral Reef Initiative, CNBC, and of course, many of you here are the Friends of Scripps.